text for today is the reading from St. Peter, his first uh, letter, and I want to reread just a small part of that to you. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. My dear friends, John tells us God is love. Not that God loves us, but that God is love. And there is a difference, because God is the one who brings love, creates love, is love, is that which helps us know what love is at all. By knowing God, we know what love is, and that is what we see as Jesus is sent to us to die for our sins. And St. Peter is trying to explain this to a group of people. i got to tell you, there are times when I, when I know that God is love. One of those times was, was this week when I found this text. When I was looking at what was going on this week and I had to write the sermon theme and, and, and all of a sudden it all came together and I went, wow, this is, this is cool that, that God would have this ready for me on, on this week. I have to tell you though that, that for all that is love and all that is wonderful about love, we know that there's this thing called hate. It's the opposite of love. Hate is that which wants to destroy, that which is angry, that which is not happy with other people. It is the opposite of what God is. And so we know because of that, we know that hatred comes from Satan who wants to distance us from God. If God is love, then distancing us from, from love is when we know that Satan has been at work. When there is hatred in this world, we can see that the devil has been working. And i got to tell you, there is no lack of examples available. It wouldn't, you know, I could stand up here all day and I could be defining hatred for hours on end. I know you really don't want to sit and hear that. I'm okay with the fact that you don't want to sit there and hear that. I don't either. That's why I don't watch the news, right? <laughs> you watch the news, what do you get? You get hatred, you get anger, you get all the things that are going wrong in this world. And so all I'd have to do is say, watch the news, and you can get 30 minutes of anger and hatred, and you can see it all in all kinds of different forms. But this week as I looked at getting a sermon theme together because it was a new month and had, had the time to, to do that, as we looked at it from this week, I had to recognize that there was one story out there that was so predominant that it had to be there for all of them. So unless you've been hiding under a rock and not watching any news or looking at any, anything, you had to hear about this guy, Donald Sterling. Right? Anybody not hear about Donald? Anybody, anybody miss it? Oh, one, a couple. All right, I'll give, you, I'll give you a quick update, okay? Donald Sterling is the owner, or was the owner, still is the owner of the Los Angeles Clippers, an NBA basketball team. And he got caught with 100 hours of rambling to his girlfriend. Not his wife, his girlfriend. He has both, okay? First problem, okay? And he had given an apartment comp, a duplex to his girlfriend, and his wife is suing his girlfriend because she got this apartment complex out of community property and says she stole it. Okay? It gets deeper. And so he rambles on and he says a whole bunch of stuff. We don't even know what he said for 100 hours, but for 30 seconds, he said, 30 seconds to a minute and a half, he said some really ugly things about African American people and especially some African American basketball players when he owns a basketball team. Okay? And besides that, before that, he'd been sued a couple of times by people who said he was racist. Now, some people say, what, what's the problem? Why, why, why did they make it such a, a big deal? Why did this happen? Aside from the fact that it was really ugly stuff that he said. Well, talk to me afterwards and I'll explain all that to you. But the reality is, he went after some things that you just can't go after. He said some things you just can't, can't get at. Okay? And aside from that, he'd done it before. And he'd done it a number of times. And you know what? In some ways, what he really did was he let us see inside of ourselves. Oh yeah, you're, I can tell you all, say, I'm not, I'm not a racist like that. I'd like to say that too, but I'd be lying. Because there are times when I'm upset with other people and the thing I focus on is the color of their skin or the color of their hair or the color of their eyes or where they go to church or where they were born. Or... As human beings, we do that. It's kind of a silly thing if you think about it. We attribute our frustration or our anger or our feelings to some group of people because of some interaction we had with somebody. 
And then we decide we're better than some other group of people or somebody, and we decide we're going to make their lives miserable and make our lives better, right? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And a lot of things this week weren't making a whole lot of sense. i got to be honest with you. There, there were people who claimed to be pastors and preachers who were coming out publicly, and it was clear that they were not sharing the love of God. What they were sharing was the love of me. Look at me. I can say something about this topic, and I can say something more outrageous than the last guy, and give me my 15 seconds on the radio or the TV, right? All kinds of things that were happening, and very few of them were focusing on God's love for all kinds of people. I gotta tell you, there were, there were two parts for me for this, for this controversy, two parts of, of, of looking at this. Before you think I'm just piling on poor Donald Sterling, let me, let me just say, there were, there were two parts here. There was the obvious part, which was, which was, which was done, where everybody could get upset with him, where everybody could say, look what he did and look how horrible it is, and, and let's build up these other, other folks who've been harmed and let's talk about what, what's right and what should be done. But then there was a not so obvious thing that we needed to look at. And that was, how did other people respond? And I listened for it, but I never once, not once, did I hear anyone say, you know what? As wrong as this was, you really got to pity somebody who's got that much hatred in their heart. Who's going to reach out and try to care for the person who is so angry and so hurtful? I gotta tell you, it's really easy to be angry at people that you don't know. It's really easy to say horrible things about people that you don't know. And if you don't believe that, all you gotta do is go to any sports story and look at or, or any story on CNN and look at all the people who comment. And look at how they yell at each other and say mean things to each other that they will type anything to each other and apparently it's okay. Because they don't know each other. They don't have to sit in the lunchroom together and stare at each other across the table. They don't have to work together on anything. They can just say whatever they want, and apparently we don't care. It's okay to say whatever you want. Well, as long as it doesn't become public, and as long as it's not out there for everybody, then you can have the piling on effect if you say something bad enough. But you can take pretty much anything online, apparently, to, to other people, and nobody says anything. So it's easy to do that. And i got to tell you, it's also easy to talk about forgiveness for people that you don't know. It's easy to say things like, well, we should forgive this person, or we should forgive that person, or it's really not that bad, or, or because we don't know them. And we don't know what hurt is going on inside of our hearts. And I say that today because if we look at the text, what Peter's talking about is day-to-day, in-your-face, forgiveness and love. He's talking about the nitty-gritty, the really tough stuff that goes on with the people that you do know. The people who are hardest to love and forgive. Notice that when I was talking with the children, I talked about your best friend. It's harder to get over the fact that when your best friend isn't nice to you. It's harder to love them in the midst of that moment because it hurts more. You can forget the people out there that you don't know. You don't have to think about them. But your best friend? Oh, you're going to think about that. You're going to wonder what's going on when it's a family member, when it's your spouse. When it's people that you're close to, that you work with, those are the people where it's going to hurt and you're going to have to struggle and endure. And that's what our text is about. There are three things that I picked out that are going on in the text in this, in this small little piece that I want to talk to you about today that have to do with love and forgiveness. The first is Peter addresses this to a group of people who are in exile. Now, different scholars talk about who this group of people might be and where they might be and what their original beliefs were. But the important word there is exile. To be in exile means that you're not living in the place you want to live. You're not living in the country you want to live or the place that you want to live. And you're certainly not living under the governmental rule that you wanted to live under. So there is some level of oppression. There is some level of taking away your freedom. So Peter's writing to a group of people who aren't particularly happy with their state in life, who aren't particularly happy with how the world around them is working, and who may even be feeling like they have a right to strike out and revolt against that oppression. And maybe they're right. They may even be right about that. It may be that what's going on is wrong in their lives. But Peter doesn't say to them to go to war. 
He doesn't say to them to battle. He doesn't say to them to get on TV and, and give their case. He says to them, I want you to look at who you are. I want you to look at who you are, Jesus. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during your time of exile. Live in reverent fear. That fear is not that being afraid, it's being in awe of who God is. It's understanding who God is in our lives. And understanding the God who loves us is above and beyond all those things that can go on in our lives, those struggles that are happening because they're in exile. So in the latter verses, when he says, now that you have purified your souls by obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love. I want to focus on those words for a minute because those words, genuine mutual love. What does that mean? What is he getting at there as he says that? What is genuine mutual love? The word that Peter uses in the Greek for that is there are three or four different words we have for love. The one he uses, the one that talks about brotherly love, the love of brothers and sisters, philios. We get our word Philadelphia from there. Brothers and sisters loving one another. How do we love each other as brothers and sisters? Only in Jesus Christ. Because i got to be honest with you. I am sure that there's at least a couple of you out there, if not half a dozen, if not half of you, if not most of you, who <laughs> would not love me if it weren't for Jesus. Fair? I mean, you don't have to shake your heads or anything, okay? It's okay, all right? I know my personality is not quite so sterling and... Oh, bad one. Not quite so sparkling, <laughs> right? That all of you would love me all the time if it weren't for Jesus, okay? I can be honest about it. You can be honest about it, too. I'm sure I do things that annoy you. I'm sure I do things that bother you. I'm sure if you were in my household, you'd know it even better. Okay? That's just life. But Peter talks about the bond that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ. How we are brought together here, how we are fed at the table and given the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And in that forgiveness, we can live in that love that Jesus provides. Which means loving each other as brothers and sisters do. Understanding that there are faults, understanding that there are struggles, and understanding that we can love each other even then. So he talks about how that happens in our faith. In faith coming to us and purifying us in that forgiveness comes to us through Jesus. But then he says it again, and here's where it gets interesting. He says to us again at the end, he says, love one another deeply from the heart. After you've become brothers and sisters in Christ, after we've reached this point, love one another deeply from the heart. Now, I, had to, I don't do word searches very often in Greek. I don't go back and look at the languages very much. That's just not what I do. I did this week because that word deeply was, was bothering me. Because it, it just doesn't seem to work. What was the meaning? What was, what was Peter getting at? And so when I looked it up, I, I, I saw it was, it was nice to see that, you know, right there in, in the Greek is, is this word kardios, which reminds us of cardiac, which tells us it is about the heart, okay? And then, you know, loving each other, that was all there. And then that word that they took for meaning deeply, what it really talks about? Being resolute. Being earnest. And then I saw a, a, a small word that was similar to it where it talks about enduring. And that's when I got it. That's when I realized what deeply from the heart means. It means that we have to be willing to love. In fact, God calls us to love in a way that's different. Now the word for love that Peter uses there is not the same word that he used earlier in the sentence. He uses the word agape, which basically means a mutual love of all people. It's a self-sacrificing love. It's a love that gives up to others. It's a love that covers all sins. It's a love that Jesus had for us. And so what he's saying there is we have to be in Christ to become brothers and sisters in Christ. And then as we are in Christ, we grow and we reach that place where he calls us to love with an enduring love. A love that says, I know that there are times when people do the wrong things, when people hurt me, when people who are close to me hurt me. 
And then I'm called to love at those moments with an endurance, with a deepness, with a willingness to keep going on. I mentioned my best friend in the children's message, and it's not like it has nothing to do with Donald Sterling, because it does. My best friend was African American. I say was because he passed away when he was 39 from a congenital heart problem. He and I played basketball together from the time we were nine when we first got together in school. And we played, you know, one on one, two on two, we played forever, okay? We played in the city gyms, we played all over the place. And I gotta tell you that one of the things that was bothering the basketball players when this whole thing went down was the fact that when you do something like that, you have certain friends who you're so close that you know everything about them while you're playing. It's this, it's this really special, magical moment when I used to know where he was on the court, what he was gonna do before he did it, and he had the same with me. When you love someone that much, when you get that close, you don't want anybody else breaking in. See, that's the problem. When somebody says things that are hurtful about your best friend, you step up and you say something. And that's why there was such incredible backlash. But the point is still this. Even though, even though we might be upset with the person who says wrong things, we have to recognize that we ourselves have done the same. That we ourselves would not want anyone seeing what's inside our heart. The things that we say when we think no one's listening. And that's the point. All of us say things, feel things. When we think no one's listening, you're looking. And they're hurtful, horrible things that Satan would want us to say. But God, who loves us, pursues us, sent his son to die for us in the midst of those moments, to die for the sins of Donald Sterling and of us and of all other people when we are hateful to God's own creation, when we're hateful to each other. And he calls us in Christ to know that brother and sister love and to take it to that next step, to know that love which is deep and enduring and goes on for a lifetime. Now, I gotta ask you, and I haven't done this before, but I'm gonna do this for the first time. Every Sunday that we have a congregational meeting, I wanna ask this question. I've never done it, but I'm gonna do it. How do you speak to each other at congregational meetings? How do you speak to each other when you're at coffee hour? How do you speak to each other? I have heard some things said that just make me ashamed. You've probably heard me say some things that made you ashamed. And I'm calling us to this piece from St. Peter that says, love at Bethany, love that has made us brothers and sisters in Christ needs to be deep and enduring and needs to be seen not only in our actions, but in our words. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you wipe away all the sins, that you wipe away the things that we say in public and the things we say in private, that you wipe away the feelings and the hurtful things that we want to do. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to share that forgiveness, to share that enduring love with each other and with the world. We pray that you would help us to walk in the steps of Jesus who was willing to forgive all who would hurt him and all who would say horrible things so that we might know the truth and the light and the love that you sent to us. In his name we pray. Amen.